Just to give you a little background on what HARP is, so you understand what I'm talking about. It's a series of antennas. Um, they look like a, a post with two crossbars, a so-called dipole antenna. And they're arranged in a perfectly measured grid. Just imagine uh, a checkerboard pattern where at every one of those corners there is an antenna. And these antennas are about 70 to 80 feet tall. They're all spaced in very, very precise distance from one another. And this is what they call phased array. Now what that means basically is that if you have a distant target, say, somewhere over there on that wall, and you have an antenna where every one of you people are sitting, and you understand that the signal that you are going to send out travels out at the speed of light, and every one of you send the same signal, who needs to send their signal first for their signals to all arrive at the same time? The person who's farthest away. So they begin transmitting first, and then it cascades down phased array. Mm -hmm. So that by the time you've all finished broadcasting your signals, they all arrive at that distant target simultaneously. Now, the reason that this is so important is because when you have an overlap of all those signals hitting the same spot at the same time, you unleash a tremendous amount of energy. Now, I've, I've actually spoken to people who worked on that array, who helped to build it, who understand what it's capable of. And even though those individual antennas we're only broadcasting at something like 50,000 or 100,000 watts. It's the overlap, the superimposition of all those signals simultaneously that makes it so powerful. He was telling me that on average, the signal that arrives at the target zone can be as high as 2.3 gigawatts. That's a billion watts. And it goes higher. It can go as high as maybe five times that, from what he was telling me. Now, why is this important? Well, think about it. If you can take a bunch of little tiny signals, and you can combine them all into one force that arrives at a distant location simultaneously. You can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. You can fry the avionics in an aircraft and make it crash, and it'll never look like it was shot down. And that has happened. You can take and broadcast a signal to a particular point in the sky where there happens to be a storm, and you can make, it, you can make that storm more powerful. So, how do they do it? That's the next question. Now, I wanted to tell you in the beginning that I have uh, a number of objectives that I'd like to do here. I'd like to explain the science, explain a little bit about how I figured out what's going on and, and the verification of that. But I'd also like to help acquaint you with things that you can see, signatures in the environment that tell you what's really going on, what's happening. Uh, there's been so many photographs that I've seen on the web of buttermilk skies, which are as normal as can be. And people, oh, it's a harp sky. Well, it's a normal event. But there are certain things that happen in the environment, like a perfectly square hole mm -hmm. in clouds. That is something to look for. That is a sign, a characteristic of some of this technology being used, because you can exactly target where the energy is unleashed. And you don't have to do it all at one time, all in one place. You can multiplex the system, which is to say you can send signals out to different locations all at different frequencies. And they have aircraft radars that do this right now to track 40 individual targets before you launch all your missiles. Mm -hmm. And so a phased array gives you a tremendous amount of versatility, capability, power for projecting force into different areas. And you can do it in a way that nobody really sees or understands. Mm -hmm. Now people say, well, you know, I don't think they can really do an earthquake with a harp system, but they can. It's in the patents. And I can tell you exactly how you could do that. It a lot of it. Well, remember, of course, that deep underground, the water that's in this, the, the crust of the earth penetrates down miles. And that water is under tremendous pressure. And it's between all the little cracks and everything. It's one of the principles that they that what I'm about to tell you is one of the principles they use in fracking. Okay. And that is that they put a lot of pressurized water into these cracks and then they use an explosive charge to make it expand and crack the rock open even more so you can get all the petroleum products out of the rock. But imagine then that you had a kind of liquid that you could put into the rock that had nanoparticles in it. And you know what the size of all those particles are. They're all exactly the same size. Now when you're talking about nanoparticles you're talking about a billionth of a meter, say 40 nanometers is 40 billionths of a meter. And this is something that's so small that if, 
If this light bulb here, this fixture, was the size of a red blood cell, which you can't even see with the naked eye without a microscope, you'd be able to line 50 of these things up next to one red blood cell. That's how tiny we're talking about. Now, when you're broadcasting a frequency in billions of hertz, and you have countless numbers of particles that are in the environment, perhaps in the water, and the water goes down to a certain depth, and you know where exactly you want this fracturing event to occur, you can target that area with a phased array, you can have all those particles heat up, and if you put enough power into it, you can create steam. You can actually cause the water to turn to steam, and it pops, just like popcorn. One of the best ways that you could actually witness this, you could act, and I've done this, is if you take an oxyacetylene torch, which burns at something like 3,600 degrees, it's enough to melt steel, drop it on a cement floor, and watch the cement floor pop like popcorn. And it will, because all the moisture that's embedded in the cement turns to steam and explodes, and the stone literally fractures. This is how you can create an earthquake deep down, if you know where to do it, when to do it, what the circumstances are. But I'm getting a little bit off track here, so let me kind of go back to how I found <coughs> this process, where it came from. Now, the Navy, the United States, the United States Navy, has been looking at the prospect of modifying weather for a very long time. One of the things about weather is that depending on what kind of systems you are working with, what kind of ships you're working with, weather can be a big problem for you to project the projection of force. So if you were able to create a very stormy environment, you could hide your approach to a target area. Or you can make it very difficult for the enemy to defend against your approach if you can control the weather over that particular area. The same is true especially for aircraft. You may have noticed when you read some of the requests for proposals that are put out by the Department of Defense for all the latest aircraft that they're building now, the F-35, the F-22, the F one of the requirements is an all-weather capability. And the reason they're doing that is because they want aircraft that can fly through the worst weather and still be used for that projection of force. So, when I was in the defense industry, it was a really exciting thing to think that planes could fly through all kinds of weather, still be able to deliver their package, their weapons, whatever it is, or you know, penetrate an enemy and stop them from doing something, whatever it might be, on act of terrorism, for example. Um, this was pretty exciting to me. But as I began looking at the idea of modifying weather, I began to look at all the other things that they could do with that once they had that capability. Now, there's so many examples it's hard to know exactly where to start, but one of the things that makes stealthy aircraft stealthy is the shape of the aircraft. It, the way it reflects the radar back at the signal source, the original radar dish that sends out the signal and bounces back. Like if you stand under this little dome here and you say something, you can hear your voice coming back at you in such a way that it's almost hard to understand what you're saying because of the acoustics in this room. So acoustics and reflected sound, reflected signals is a big part of radar. So if you have a way of minimizing the amount of reflected energy from your aircraft, you have a better chance of going into an area that's defended by a radar system and missiles that rely on radar to home in on your aircraft. So what they would do is they would modify the shape and the materials that were used in the aircraft so they could minimize the amount of reflected energy coming back to the enemy radar system. It's what they call a radar cross-section, or RCS. So, as they began looking at this, they realized that one of the things that they could do to help defeat an air-to-air -air attack, say one plane firing a missile at another plane, maybe your plane, is that you could throw these particles of aluminum out into the air. It's called chaff. And what this would do would be create a, a much more reflective, a much more desirable target from the standpoint of the missile's little listener, the little ear that's listening for that reflected signal. Usually the signal is transmitted by the aircraft, the aircraft paints the, uh, the opponent with the signal, and that reflected energy is what guides the missile to the target. So if you can put out a big cloud of chaff and then turn away suddenly, the missile is going to want to go into that, that cloud of aluminum particles and explode because it thinks this is a bigger aircraft, this is a bigger, better target. So. As time went on, they began to find that they could use smaller and smaller particles of aluminum, and they could actually get down to a size where these little filaments and things that they were using 
in the chat would actually begin to resonate or match the frequency of the different types of radar that were known to be used by the Russians, the Soviet Union, and China. And then they thought, well, it would be, be great to put this right in the paint so that you could actually take that frequency and those signals, and instead of having it reflect the radar signal back, it converts it to heat. And so the plane heats up a little bit, but its radar cross-section is dramatically reduced. So it gives you more of a stealthy capability, so you're not so much of a target. Now, if you think about it, this is kind of what they're doing with the air, in a way. This is how they can control the weather. You sprinkle a bunch of particles into the air through an aircraft. This is one of many applications, but you put these particles in the air, you hit them with a signal, say from HARP, or any kind of a, a microwave transmitter that is tuned to the particular frequency of those particles, and you can make all those particles heat up. Now the thing that makes nanoparticles so dangerous is because they are so small that they can literally be absorbed right through the skin, definitely through respiration. So many people I know that talk about a metallic taste in their mouth when the, cloud, the trails are going on. These are people who are very vulnerable to this kind of thing. But the, the problem comes when you, sorry, I lose track of my thoughts here, but, but uh, the, the point is that these materials, while they have certain benefits from a defensive standpoint, from a, a, a strategic standpoint, they can be very harmful to individuals in the environment. Well, thank you. Exactly what I was thinking. You must have been reading my mind. I'm an animal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Speaking of water. So anyway, the idea is that you can put these particles in the environment, hit them with a signal that causes them to heat up. And because you've so dramatically increased the amount of surface area from all those particles, you are able to have a much greater impact on the environment that they are distributed within. You can take a ball of aluminum the size of my fist and break it down into trillions upon trillions of these particles when they're all that size. And then you spray them out the back of an airplane and you can cover a tremendous area. Now let's say that that's exactly what we're looking at is an area that has a distribution of these particles. And so now, if you have a lot of moist air coming in off the Pacific Ocean, and you're in an area where there's a lot of mountains, and you have a lot of regional instability that's going to mix it all up very well, like a big blender, you're going to have an even distribution of this material in the environment, an environment that's filled with a lot of moist, humid air off the Pacific. Then you hit that area with a signal, and you can cause all of that material to heat up and rise in a big convective cell to an altitude where the temperature is much colder and it turns into a big powerful storm system. Now this is how you can build up and really turn a hurricane into a killer. It's also one of the ways that you can steer a storm system or a hurricane. And the way you do that is you have to first understand the dynamics that goes on within weather itself. I'm going to have to give you a few terms to help you understand a little bit about how weather works. When they talk about a high pressure system, they're talking about cold air that's sinking down. It's compact. When cold air, or when air is cold, it, it tends to condense and come closer in together to form uh, a much heavier air mass. So it's a high pressure system. A low pressure system is where you have things that are being heated up, and so there's a low pressure, a low barometric pressure in the area because you have heat and you have the air mass convecting and rising and carrying the moisture out of the environment. Now, it's the boundary between these two different types of systems where you get movement because they're like the wheels or the gears of an engine that are turning against one another. Now, if you think about the Earth and the way it turns, for example, the Earth is about 25,000 miles around the circumference of the equator. And so, in order for any point on the equator to make a 24-hour cycle, around the entire circumference of the Earth. It has to be moving at a little over a thousand miles an hour. Make sense? Okay. So, if you're standing on the pole, the North Pole, in 24 hours, all you do is this. 
but it takes you 24 hours just to do that. So your relative motion compared to the equator is much slower. So between the equator and the North Pole, or the South Pole, the relative movement is a difference that's been called the Coriolis effect. So what happens is when an air mass is heated up, it rises, in the northern hemisphere it tends to turn counterclockwise because the part that's closest to the equator is turning faster so it, it spins like this. A high pressure system as it's coming down tends to go in the opposite direction. So where you have the two systems turning against one another like two gears, you have a really rapid jet of air moving. And this is how you can control the path of the jet stream. This is how you can control where the storms go. Now, more recently... Wait, hold on, hold on. Tell me again how you control the path. I get the cryos effect. Okay. If you have a high pressure system that's turning clockwise mm -hmm. in the northern hemisphere, and you have a low pressure system right next to it that's turning in the opposite direction, <coughs> it's just like two gears that are yeah. turning against one. But the, the movement of the air that moves fastest is in between. Okay. And so if you pick and oh, choose... Okay, you got it? So you define where cool those are. Yes. And then you By controlling, let's say, yeah. you spray in one area, and it cools down the atmosphere, so you create a high pressure system. But you have another area where you've sprayed, and you hit it with a signal to warm it up, so it performs a low pressure system. And then because of the Coriolis effect, you have this rotation going on. And where those two systems meet, the interference between the two of them will be driving air masses at much faster speeds. If you've ever seen some of the time-lapse photography of these different kinds of systems, you'll actually see multiple layers where the clouds are going in different directions. And people wonder how that's possible. And it's because you have different systems, different levels, sort of working in stratified layers. You can control when and where these things do what they do. If you have particles, let's say, this is just one strategy, let's say you have three different layers, and each layer has a unique size of nanoparticle, 100 nanometers, 60 nanometers, 40 nanometers. Each one responds to a different frequency. Then you hit each of those layers with a different frequency and you can make it do all kinds of things. You can make the bottom one push up through the other two. You can make the top one pull up, actually start to create a bubble in the ionosphere. You can actually slow down or deflect the trajectory of satellites and ICBMs coming in through the atmosphere because of unanticipated aerodynamic drag, things like that. There's lots of things that you can do. Just a second. So, how do we know that this really works? I'll give you some examples. Of course, there's the radar cross-section thing that we talked about several years ago. There was a television broadcast engineer in Florida by the name of John Kansius. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but he developed a system for using seawater as fuel. And all he had to do was take that seawater and subject it to a microwave burst of energy. And it would instantly sublimate the hydrogen and the oxygen in the seawater. And because of the heat that would be created in that moment, it would instantly begin to burn. So he could literally take a test tube of seawater, hit it with just the right frequency to break up the water molecule, and then ignite all in one step. So he could literally use seawater as fuel. Now while he was doing this, he actually was suffering from cancer. And so he wanted to find a way to non-invasively treat his cancer. And what he theorized was, that based on another discovery that he apparently became aware of, and that was that nanoparticles of gold and carbon will stick to a particular protein that is unique to malignancies in your body. And so what he theorized was that if you were able to infuse these nanoparticles into a patient, the circulatory system would carry those nanoparticles to wherever the cancer tumors were, whether they metastasized, whatever, in the brain, in your toe, you know, in your elbow, wherever they might be, because tumors, soft tissue tumors anyway, tend to require a blood supply because the tissue grows so much faster. It actually releases an enzyme called cyclooxygenase 2 that builds a blood supply to feed the tumor because it's faster grow rate, growth rate. So you're almost guaranteed that no matter where the tumor is in your body, by infusing these gold or carbon nanoparticles, they'll go to the tumor. And then if you know what the size of those particles is, 
you can lightly irradiate the patient's body with that tuned frequency. It causes the tissue in the tumor to heat up to 130 degrees, which is enough to kill the cancer, but not harm your normal healthy cells. So you have a, a way of non-invasively taking out a cancer. Now, but this is kind of the same thing that's going on with the environment. You can put these nanoparticles, not necessarily gold or carbon, but aluminum oxide, put these particles into the environment, hit them with a signal, and cause a region to heat up and manipulate the weather by causing warm, moist air to rise to a little higher altitude where it will turn into a storm. So, but there are other applications here too. Now most of this has to do with the weaponization of weather. Um, imagine that you have a, um, a place that you need to project your forces for whatever reason, to take over somebody's oil field, or to stop a terrorist act from occurring, whatever it might be. And you want to be sure that you can get in there as quickly and safely as possible to do the job and maybe stay or get out, depending on what the mission profile is. One of the ways that you can do this, of course, is to disable the ability of the enemy to move within the environment. It's called battlefield denial. Mm. And so one of the ways that you can do that is, of course, create a terrible storm or flooding or hailstones the size of baseballs. Now, you might think that that's impossible, but it really is. You could find pictures of them on the internet, and you may wonder, well, how, how can you actually engineer a hailstone or a bunch of hailstones the size of a softball or a baseball? It's very simple. That when you have nanoparticles in the environment, pervasively through the whole environment, you hit them with this signal and you heat them up, the convection cell can be so powerful, the rising forces of the updraft can be so powerful that as the moisture in that air gets to that higher altitude and begins to turn to, to water condensation, raindrops, and then freezes as it continues to be pushed higher and higher, eventually it gets heavy and it begins to move out to the perimeter of the system and it begins to fall as rain or fall as small particles of ice. Now if you've ever taken a hailstone and sliced it open, you'll find that it looks just like an onion inside. It's layer upon layer of ice. One after the other, it's built up. And so because these convection cells are so extremely powerful, hurricane force winds pushing the air and the, the, the moisture in the air up to higher altitudes. Each time those droplets start to freeze and fall again, they're sucked back up into the cycle again and yet another layer of ice is added to the, to the, to the hailstone. And so if you do this enough times, you eventually have hailstones that get so big that the air draft, the upward convection cell can no longer keep them aloft and they fall to the ground. Some of the pictures that I've seen, you can, you can kind of tell what's been going on, but it gets to the point where the individual hailstone gets so heavy that it actually begins, instead of forming a new layer, it just basically starts attaching other hailstones to its sides. So it winds up looking like, like a, a, a dog's chewy toy with all those little nubby things all over it. But, uh, and so that's what they look like when they land. And you can find video of these things landing in people's swimming pools so they can actually see what it looks like without it breaking on the ground. But uh, So imagine that you're the enemy and uh, the military force of the United States wants to come into your country and they want to be sure that you're not going to be a problem. One of the best ways to disable an enemy force is to make sure that they can't see you with their radar. You drop a big hailstone on them and all their equipment gets damaged. They can't use it. Or the canopies on their aircraft are all shattered so they can't fly. Or you can't even fly through this kind of material because it'll ruin the jet engine. Your plane will blow up. So there's all kinds of things that you can do to suppress the activity of an enemy. But then again, it can be used on us too. And it's not that difficult to understand the technology. I mean, if I can figure it out, I'm sure that somebody, perhaps someone in the audience who's, who's got a degree, and knows a little bit about material science and things like that can figure out just like I did. Most of what I've been able to find I've found in, in resources that are available to all of you. And so one of the things I want to do, one of the objectives that I wanted to address here was helping you to familiarize yourself with the science and where you can find these answers for yourself. So you can prove it to yourself. If you're, if you're a skeptic and you don't believe and you think it's all baloney, I don't blame you because I was there myself. But 
you should be able to find this information yourself. Now, for example, how do we know that they had any idea that this stuff was harmful? We know because their own research papers say so. Now, one of the papers that really sticks out in my mind is a paper that I found just plugging in those search terms that I told you before, toxicology, aluminum nanoparticles, um, harmful, you know, those kinds of phrases. And what al almost immediately popped up was a study done by the Air Force between, I believe it was June of 1993 and uh, March of 2001. And they had already heavily engaged in these spraying campaigns by that time. So it shows us that in spite of what they found out in this study, they already knew. They already knew it would be harmful and they did it anyway. So the next question becomes why. But let me explain to you why it's harmful. Aluminum nanoparticles in particular have the ability to suppress your immune system, especially if you breathe them in. Now, the first line of defense in your immune system is the white blood cell, particularly the white blood cells that are in and around the little air sacs in your lungs. If you've ever seen a, a diagram, a microscopic sort of blown up diagram of what your lungs do when you breathe is these bronchial tubes that come down through your through your throat and branch out into what they call bronchial tubes and at the end of all those little tubes are these little tiny air sacs that expand and contract as you breathe. A lot of it's driven by the, the diaphragm and the muscles in the chest and the abdomen. But anyway, there are these little white blood cells, they're called macrophages, that are in these little air sacs called alveoli. And they're there specifically to protect you against infection or toxic uh, invaders in your lungs. And so, what they found in the study, it was a study that was conducted on rats, laboratory rats, and the title of the study was In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's just a fancy way of saying, looking at living systems, looking at the toxicity of these particular particles, to the white blood cells in the lungs of rats and their alveoli. So what they found was that this material, these nanoparticles, would suppress the ability of white blood cells to perform a process called phagocytosis. Now if you've ever seen a, a video of an amoeba swimming up to a germ, engulfing it to digest it, that's essentially what a white blood cell does when it goes after a germ in your body. It swims up to it and engulfs it, and that's called phagocytosis. So this process is suppressed by the presence of aluminum oxide nanoparticles and aluminum nanoparticles. Now, realizing, of course, that some people in our society have breathing problems, asthma, COPD, um, allergies, all of these things make you more vulnerable when you're in an environment that's saturated with these aluminum nanoparticles. <coughs> So, and the, the awful thing about it is these things are so tiny, there really isn't any kind of a filtration system that I know of that will filter them out to the point where you can be 100% safe. You can stay indoors, you can put a filter on, but this stuff can still be through the filter. That's how tiny these particles are. And the other side of that is that because these particles are so pervasive, can literally go into every environment, if you have just the right kind of signal that you could send out, you can create a real-time 3D image of everything in that environment, inside the buildings, outside the buildings. You can know where every tree, every rock is. You can know where every car is parked. And you can do this without ever going into the country. You can do it from outer space. With a pair of satellites that are teamed up like a pair of big eyeballs, give you a nice 3D image of what's going on. So, you can understand part of what is going on there. I mean, after all, the, the, the word radar originally came from the phrase, it's kind of an acronym, but for the phrase, radio detection and ranging. Oh. So using a radio <coughs> signal to send it out into the environment, you get a return signal, and from that signal you can tell what's going on out there. You can see the movement of other vehicles, you can see the ground, even have types of radar now that can be broadcast at the ground, what is called ground penetrating radar. 
Maybe I should stand a little bit further back. So it is like radar, it's not like MRI or NMR? Well, that's, that's one of the other things that I'm going to get to in a minute. It's a good, I'm glad you brought that up because it shows that the gears are turning in your mind and that's good because if you understand that these particles can be assembled in a variety of ways, um, they have particles that are called oxide-coated nanoparticles, which may have an oxide of one material surrounding a core of something else. Let's say you have a core of iron, which is a, a particle that can be magnetized. It will react to the Earth's magnetic field. And then you can surround it with uh, a non-magnetic a non material that is conductive, like aluminum. Now, the theory is that if you hit these particles with a particular signal all at the same time, that they can momentarily realign with a particular signal source, and then when they pop back to alignment with the Earth's magnetic field, you get that same signal, magnetic resonance, that you would get with an MRI. When they do a 3D image of what's inside your brain or some other part of your body, so you can understand how this kind of a system can be particularly useful to a military or a government that's trying to figure out what's going on inside a building somewhere in Iran where they're designing nuclear weapons. You can see how it would be very useful to figure out what's going on inside of a, a location where terrorists have some hostages. You may not be able to see exactly what's going on, but at least you can know what the dimensions of the environment are. So, a few years ago, there was an event where an entire flock of blackbirds collapsed and died, fell out of the sky, all at the same time. And everyone wondered, how in the hell is that possible? They must have flown through a crowd, a cloud of some kind of biological agent. Well, they wouldn't have to. Because if they happened to be exposed to, say, an unusually high level of these nanoparticles, which nest in the lungs, and all these birds were necropsied, they did an autopsy on the birds, and they found that their lungs had been destroyed. Now, you have to be able to work pretty fast to drop an entire flock of birds right in the spot where they were flying. And there's only really one way to do that, and that would be electronically. And so, these little birds happen to be flying through maybe a high concentration of these nanoparticles floating in the air. And someone who probably had the intent of controlling the weather at some place sent a signal out, a strong signal, and these birds were probably pretty close to the signal source where it would be more powerful. And so, it essentially, the same process as what was described by John Kansius in his cancer cure happened to the lungs of the little birds because they were in close proximity to the signal source. So their lungs basically got fried. And every one of them, laying on the ground, they, they examined, they found that the lung tissue was hemorrhaging because something, some agent that they weren't able to detect. They never did say that it was a particular kind of germ or pathogen. All they said was they all died at the same moment. They tried to attribute it to fireworks, if you can believe that. But, so this will give you an idea of how dangerous this technology can be. Now, there's all kinds of things that you can do with this technology. There's also some things that you might be able to do that would help to resolve some very serious issues environmentally right now. It's happening uh, just off the shore of Japan near Fukushima. Now, you all probably remember about the earthquake that happened off the coast of Japan. And there's all kinds of theories about the Japanese and the Chinese talking about turning one of their currencies into the new... Um, uh, currency? Well, yes, the, the new currency that everyone used as a basis for trading oil and that kind of thing, which is the place that the U.S. dollar has right now. And so when the governments of those countries weren't responsive to... Uh, our encouragement to stop that, um, maybe we decided to give them an earthquake to think twice. The problem is that, of course, when all those reactors began to melt down in Fukushima, and all that radioactive material was emitted into the environment, the Japanese were stuck with one big problem, that was that there's a major aquifer, an underground stream that flows right through that area. And so when these reactors burned down and the, and the aquifer itself became polluted, 
with cesium-137 and all these different radioactive materials, they had no choice but basically just dump it in the sea because they had no place to put it. 88,000 gallons a day since the event happened. So there's a tremendous plume of radioactivity that's passing across the Pacific right now. Some of it's already reached our shores. Now, how would nanoparticles help us? Well, there are certain kinds of elements, cadmium, for example, that are very absorbent of radioactive emissions. But of course, cadmium can also be very toxic in the environment if you happen to get it into your system. So one of the proposals that I submitted, and I don't know whether they've acted on it or not, is to create a multi-layered nanoparticle with a core of cadmium and an outer shell of silica or glass. <coughs> so it would not react chemically with the environment. But if it was dropped into the environment, it would be able to absorb some of that energy and take it down to the depths of the ocean where it might not be as harmful to the creatures in the ocean. Whether or not they do this, I don't know. But one of the things we do know, this is something that's been a subject of much controversy, is the question of whether or not there is a climate change going on, whether global warming is real. You know, I was skeptical for a long time, and I, and I I've heard my share of Rush Limbaugh and Dr. Michael Savage and these people screaming that all the environmentalists are a bunch of liars and it's a hoax and it's not true. But there are certain things that I keep an eye on because I want to know for myself. I don't completely rely on the things that these people are saying because I feel like in a way it's almost like propaganda. But there's some other things going on that many people haven't quite put all the pieces of the puzzle together yet. If you looked at any of the investigations, independent investigations, that have been launched about 9-11 and the World Trade Center coming down, there's a lot of discussion about the use of thermate explosives and nano-thermate explosives. There was more than enough evidence taken from the site to show that at some point there was nanothermate used in the destruction of those buildings. Now, nanothermate is one of the types of explosives that you like to use if you're going to execute the controlled demolition of a building. The reason is because aluminum oxide is a combination of two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. This particular element readily combines with oxygen when it's hot, when it's molten. And so if you can get aluminum oxide, which already has the oxygen attached to it, and introduce it into a chemical reaction where there's heat, all of that, action, that, that oxygen is released at once. So the temperature goes way up. It's one of the reasons why when you're welding aluminum, like a heliarc welding, you're using helium, an inert gas, that shields the, the molten puddle of aluminum so that oxygen can't combine with it and create a weaker weld. So if you are introducing aluminum oxide into a chemical reaction, like an explosive, it releases a tremendous amount of oxygen, a tremendous amount of heat is created, and that will melt steel girders and the building collapses. Now, some of the other materials that we're finding in these nanoparticle aerosols are barium and strontium. And if you look it up, you can look it up right on Wikipedia if you want, that these are also materials that you happen to find in nanothermic. Barium and strontium are known to be used in pyrotechnics, fireworks, but they're also used in explosives because they somehow augment the explosive reaction. Well, it turns out that these are the very same things that they're spraying in some of these aerosols. So why is this a problem? Well, for one thing, aluminum is a conductor. <coughs> It's the same material that these high voltage power lines are made out of. The wire is made out of aluminum. It's a conductor, but it's non-magnetic. That's why, one of the reasons. But if you put a lot of this material in the air, the air becomes more conductive. It's more conducive to an electrical discharge, like lightning. Okay. So one of the things you'll notice about storms is that usually before they drop the rain, there's always a lightning discharge. There's an electrical process that goes on there. We know this electricity actually radiates both upward into the ionosphere 
and down to the ground. This is something we found through the space program. They're called sprites. You notice these flashes of color going up into the ionosphere above these thunderstorms. And it's a like a short circuit between one area of electricity and another, two different polarities, and a short circuit that occurs during the lightning discharge, to put it in simple terms. Now, what if you could use that as a weapon? Well, why would you want to use lightning as a weapon? Very simple. It looks like a natural phenomenon. So nobody can point to you and say, ah, you hit me with lightning. I know you did. But in fact, it can be used as a weapon. And one of the ways you can use lightning as a weapon, you put a lot of these materials into the air, it raises what is called the electrostatic potential of the atmosphere. It makes it easier for electricity to pass through that body because you have all these little tiny particles that are conducted floating in the air. Okay. How do you get it to happen where you want it to happen? Just recently, Dr. Michio Kaku, who is a well-known physicist, was on one of the TV stations talking about using a trillion watt laser to bring down lightning bolts wherever you want them. Now, he was talking in the context of shooting a laser beam up into the sky. But why would you want lightning to come right back down on you? That doesn't make any sense at all. Now, one of the things that I worked on in the defense industry before I sort of phased myself out was the airborne laser. It's what they call the chemical oxygen iodine laser. And they put it into a 747. It had an aperture on the front of like a big eyeball with a cross section about six feet across and a special mirror that would change shape to make sure that the beam could be focused hundreds of miles away for shooting down ICBMs during their ascent. It was a great defensive posture, great thing to have. But what most people don't know is that they were able to scale that system down to fit into uh, a V-22 Osprey or a C-130, just like the Forestry Service uses when they're fighting fires. Now, it just so happens that a year or two ago, there was a big fire down near Bernie in Southern California. Now, one of the things that was unusual about that fire was the total number of lightning strikes that came out of the thunderstorm that was responsible for that fire and other fires around it getting started. It was 8,000 lightning strikes from one storm. That seemed a little unusual. But when the newspaper, the record searchlight, published a map of where all these fires had been started by the lightning strikes, it was a perfect checkerboard pattern. And wherever those lines crossed was a strike. Now, if you know anything about lightning and living in an area where there's lots of mountains. What's the name of the fire again? Excuse me, sorry. It was the Eiler Fire. And it was on the front cover of the record searchlight. I, if, well, How do you spell that? Uh, E-I-L-E-R. But um, anyhow, so the point is that if you are able to control where lightning comes down by sending a laser beam through an environment that's already primed and ready to fire, an electrical discharge, one that has lots of nanoparticles floating around that makes it easier for the electricity to be conducted. You can pick and choose where the lightning bolt strikes. Well, just recently, there was a paper published by DARPA, and they've actually developed the whole weapon system around it. It's called a laser-induced plasma channel. Basically, you can send out a laser beam in a frequency range that you cannot see visibly with the eye. And then, at a given moment, use a, a bank of highly charged capacitors or a Tesla coil, some source of high voltage electricity, and it'll just follow that beam right to its end, wherever you point it. So let's say you wanted to pick a particular vehicle out of a crowd and stop its engine, fry the electronics in that car and stop it in its place, maybe a terrorist. You hit it with a, a beam of light from an aircraft that has this electrical system with it, send a bolt of lightning down there and fry the electronics that plane, or that, that car, and stop it in its tracks. But you can do it to people too. So there's a lot of things going on, very scary things that can be done with these kinds of materials. And so the question becomes, why is it happening? Why is it going on? Aren't they listening to us? There's lots of people saying, we don't like this, stop this. I've said it myself. I've said it on the radio many times. 
talking to different hosts from different programs. So I began asking myself, why are they not stopping? They've got their own research paper that says this stuff is harmful. Now, I look at this logically and I say to myself, okay, the United States government, every other government on the face of the planet is like a big hungry animal. And the food that they eat are taxpayer dollars. So obviously they want as many taxpayers as they can. That's why the borders seem to be wide open and they've got lots of new taxpayers coming in all the time. So why would they want to kill us? It doesn't make any sense. So I begin to think that maybe there was something else going on. Something else in the environment that all of this other activity is kind of a byproduct or a sort of a footprint of what's going on, but we're not really seeing the whole picture. So I started looking at other problems that might be solved by this kind of stuff happening in the environment. Now, I mentioned stealth before. There's lots of different kinds of stealth. There's acoustic stealth, where you produce a signal that nullifies the roar of the jet engine. The F-117 has a feature like that. The stealth bomber, the Spirit, has something like that. Kind of an exhaust diffuser. But they can also introduce the signal into the, the shearing effect of that exhaust gas coming out of the engine. So they can make it more quiet, make it harder to hear the planes. There's visual stealth, where you camouflage the plane so that its color makes it more difficult to see in the air. Or if it's on the ground, you have like a... a, a green and gray and tan pattern, so that someone in the air makes it's harder for them to see that plane. There's radar stealth, which I mentioned before, and there's thermal stealth, the amount of heat that's produced by the exhaust of an aircraft, and they found ways to suppress that too. But the hardest thing of all to suppress, from a standpoint of being stealthy, is your ability to see something with your own two eyes. Pretty hard to defeat that. But it turns out that They've been working on something like that for a very long time. And they have it now. And if you know where to look, you can see this stuff in operation. And it's pretty spooky. It's like seeing aircraft made out of glass. And so, let's say that some other country on the face of this planet got there first. That they were able to create this technology and perfect it before we were. What do you do? If you can't see it, and you can't hear it, you can't track its thermal image, you can't see it on radar, you can't see it with your eyes, how do you track it? Well, it, it almost slapped me in the face when, it, when I thought of this. But remember how I was talking about you send a signal out and all of those particles heat up? Okay. If you've got something flying through those particles, punch, punching a tunnel, as it were, through those particles, because it's using a type of propulsion system that doesn't rely on wings or jet engines. Something really advanced. And, and they have this stuff. It leaves a tunnel where there's an absence of those particles in the air. And so if you have a signal going out into the environment, you can see the tunnel that this thing bores through the air. Even though you can't see the object, you can see where it's been. It's kind of like the way they learned how to track Soviet submarines. Mm -hmm because they found that as submarines were moving below the water, that they'd leave a little shock wave that would come up to the surface and the ripples, you could see those ripples from space with a satellite if you knew what to look for. It's kind of like these little insects that run across the surface of the water, they call them water striders in some places, and they leave that little V-shaped trail of, of uh, little ripples on the water. That's kind of what, it slowed down a lot, but that's kind of what a Soviet or an American submarine looks like from the air if you're looking at the surface of the ocean. So imagine then that you had to develop a system that would help you to see something that's completely invisible. And this is one of the ways you would do it. You put something into the environment that basically causes the environment to light up. And then you track something that punches a hole through that environment that you can't see with any other kind of detective device. Now, it sounds like science fiction, but I can tell you that it exists because I've seen it myself. And it is a mind-blowing event, let me tell you. So, I began sort of 
making suggestions when I do these interviews on radio programs, internet radio, <coughs> suggesting that there might be other ways in which to manipulate the weather, if that's really what they want to do, without putting all of these particles into the environment. Like I mentioned before, that all of these particles, that uh, like aluminum, barium, and strontium, when they get into the ground, they're so tiny that they can be absorbed through the root structure into the trees. And so when there's lightning strikes, the forest fires are much harder to put out. And so instead of putting particles into the environment that help you to detect something that's impossible to see, maybe you could use something besides aluminum or barium or strontium. Maybe something like silica, which is basically just sand. Sand, little tiny microspheres of sand that are polished, are the very thing that they put into projection screens so that you get a nice reflected surface. So it would be an ideal thing to put into the environment. If you really want to control solar radiation, SRM, solar radiation management, if you really want to reflect some of that heat away, why not put something in the environment that really will be reflected, like little tiny mirrors, little pieces of silicon? And then I found a NASA paper from 2001 that suggests almost exactly that. It was called, and I don't remember the complete title of the document, it was called uh, Gelled and Metallized Fuels. Now this paper goes into using what they call silica-based aerogels and aluminum oxide nanoparticles as something to augment the fuel in jet aircraft and other propellants, like in rocket engines, things like that. And the reason is because when the aluminum oxide releases all of these little atoms of oxygen into the chemical reaction, you get a much more efficient combustion. You get more thrust, you get more altitude, you get longer range out of an aircraft that has this stuff in the fuel. And there's a side benefit. A lot of people don't realize that the air you're breathing right now is only about 30% oxygen. The rest of it's nitrogen, believe it or not. So, as you go higher in altitude, there's less and less oxygen for a jet engine to breathe. So what better way to enhance the efficiency of a jet engine than to give it a little more oxygen than it's used to getting? But if you can put it right in the fuel, albeit completely inert, the only time it really comes into effect is during the combustion reaction in the jet engine, which means that you can also fly much higher, where the air is much thinner, where it's a lot harder to reach you with an anti-aircraft missile. Or if you have a laser beam you're using to shoot down somebody else's missiles, it allows you to fly much higher where the air is thinner and your laser beam will go much further. So these are all things that sort of overlap and play into the science behind these materials. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. But the punchline on the business about silica aerogels in the fuel, it also helps to keep these nanoparticles lofted. It's part of why the trails spread out and stay for so long. Because the silica is absorbing some of that solar radiation and it's helping it to stay aloft. They're saying that in the papers that I've read, that it can be up to three months before this stuff comes down again. So, the punchline was, about a month ago, I found a video that came from the Middle East. And these, uh, a couple of these uh, Arab guys were walking around and they see this thing floating down out of the sky. And it looks like a big wad of subsets. Mm -hmm. And it's a big glob of silicon-based aerogel that came from one of these chemtrails. So that was a proof that they're actually doing it. It's just one of many things. But the idea is that you can use different materials to achieve different ends. Some of them good, some of them bad. And so this is, this is where I've tried to resolve these questions in my own mind. Why are they doing this? And I think that if I'm reading the signals right, they think that national defense is more important than your personal health. So that may be the reason. Here's another little... Who did they defend? That's exactly right. But so, so then I, you know, I, I toy with the conspiracy theories like everybody else. You know, what if they're doing this? What if they're doing that? Okay. If an entire forest burns down, 
who benefits? The lumber company. And it doesn't seem like it would, except that when an entire forest burns down, you've got the most powerful argument right there for why the area should be locked in spite of an environmentalist legal effort to stop the logging from occurring. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't make sense, but most forest fires, if, if they're suppressed properly, it's only the outer part of the locks that are destroyed. Some of the other things that are happening behind the scenes during these fires is it's giving the sheriff and the local police carte blanche to go in and pull up all the marijuana, even the label, legal grows. <laughs> And they've been doing this. They've been doing it with regularity now for at least the last five years. This happened down in um, the Clover Fire in the Reading area. There were people who were supposedly, they evacuated everyone, they blockaded all the streets, wouldn't let anybody into the area. Someone died trying to protect their house in that area, and yet at 1 o'clock in the morning, a CDF fire truck comes around with a big semi behind them, fish and wildlife, marijuana eradication, and they're pulling up all the legal roads everywhere. While everybody else is out there fighting the fire and the people can't come in and see what's going on at 1 o'clock in the morning, they're pulling up all the marijuana. Mm -hmm. This is happening all over the place. Now, that may be one reason. One of the things that I noticed also is that the Sierra Nevada mountains have an awful lot of volcanic history, which means that another one of the components you look for in thermate explosives, sulfur, mm -hmm. is right there in the environment, already waiting to go. Okay. So, if you put aluminum oxide, barium, strontium, and you already have sulfur, and I'm sure there's some iron oxide in the environment, you've got a perfect recipe for a high temperature fire. Now, I've talked to firefighters who've been in those fires, fought in those fires, and said that they were incredibly difficult to suppress. They seemed to burn much hotter than they were used to. And I believe that this is the reason why, is this stuff that's coming out of the sky. Now, the argument that I was putting forth a minute ago about harvesting timber that may otherwise not be harvested because of an environmental lawsuit. I looked at the areas where these fires occurred, and I looked at the, the company, or the one company in particular, that seems to hold much of that land. And it, it's the same company, one that I'm sure you've all heard of, Sierra or something. Anyway, so it's very difficult to argue with a justification for harvesting timber in an area that's already been burned because it brings all kinds of taxpayer dollars into the area for reforestation, environmental remediation, all these different things. Lots of money into the economy, which is good for employment, it's good for the tax base. There's a lot of people that are not going to argue with that. This is just one of those little conspiracy theories that sort of passed through my brain while I was looking at all this, especially when I noticed, just to say, especially when I noticed that perfect grid pattern where all the fires had started, particularly in the case of the Ireland fire. There are a couple other processes that a lot of it can be timing. For example, if you want an area to stay warm, let's say this area you want it to stay warm during the night, when do you spray? Do you spray during the day? No. You spray at night. You spray just off the coast, which you see quite often, and then as night begins to fall, the clouds come rolling in, and it's a big thermal barrier that holds the warmth in holds the moisture in. Or if you want it to stay cold at night, you spray during the day. So it shields the area from sunlight, keeping it cooler, 15, 20 degrees cooler. And then at night, the clouds move on, and you have all the radiational cooling that occurs during the night. When it's a clear sky, you notice how it's much colder because there's no clouds to hold the heat in. So these are ways that you can manipulate temperature, and temperature affects the, the way of, of air density. For example, when it's cold, the air comes together, it's very dense. When it's warm, it expands and it rises. So these are things that you can do to manipulate the weather. Now, as far as what she was saying about it becoming colder, one of the things we've noticed is that the soot being produced by all these fires is being carried aloft because of the high temperatures of those fires. It's being carried aloft and it's circulating up and it's depositing in the Arctic. There's a scientist by the name of Jason Box. He's overseeing something called the Dark Snow Project in Greenland. And there's been a number of articles, very convincing articles, articles written about this uh, in Rolling Stone magazine, of other things, uh, in National Geographic. And it just so happens that 
the very issue of Rolling Stone magazine, it had the picture of the Boston Marathon bomber, uh, Zilkar Sarnia, I think his name was. All of the conservative talk shows said, oh, don't go buy the magazine. You don't want to make a rock star of a terrorist. But it just so happens that very same magazine had an article about Jason Box and all the research he's doing with the Dark Snow Project up in the Arctic. And what he found is that the soot, the carbon, from all these forest fires is landing on the snowpack and the ice of Greenland and other places. And it's reducing the reflectivity. In fact, in some places, instead of rocks off, they use coal, coal dust, to make the snow melt so that they can plow the roads more easily. Well, that's what's happening up there, is it's causing the snow to melt much faster. Now, there's all these other environmental consequences from this. One of the things that's happening is that the, uh, the tundra is beginning to collapse. Now, the tundra, in some areas of the northern hemisphere, uh, mostly in the northern hemisphere, uh, is, is ice that dates back 250,000 years. It's 150 feet thick. And it has all kinds of dead plant and animal material that's never had an opportunity to decompose. So all that material is now starting to decompose. And it's releasing a tremendous amount of methane and a lot of carbon dioxide, which is accelerating this process. There, I've seen videos of people flying over these areas of the tundra where the forests are collapsing because the ice that's in the soil is no longer frozen, no longer able to support the root structure. And the trees are falling. And of course, as they die, that's more carbon more methane into the environment. So one of the things that's happening, it, it, we, you start to see how these things are interconnected, and it's just, it, it's really frightening, because what you find is that ice, when it falls out of the sky in the form of snow or rain, and accumulates and freezes, it's like distilled water. It has no mineral content. And so when it melts again, and it flows down into the ocean, it still has no mineral content to speak of. Now, that doesn't sound like it's a big of a deal, except that most of the plankton that's in the, the top 30 feet or so of the ocean relies on mineral content to survive. And so you find massive plankton die-offs. And as a result of the plankton die-off, this is both the zooplankton, which are little you know, microcellular organisms, and phytoplankton, which are the single-cell plants, it's all dying off. And so all of the organisms up through the food chain that rely on that foundation are beginning to die. The little krill, the little shrimp that eat these organisms are dying, and so the, the birds and the fish that rely on these things as a food source, they're starting to die. They're washing up on the shores by the thousands right now. So the other thing that's happening is that as the Earth turns, believe it or not, the Earth actually creates a kind of centrifugal force, like swinging a rock on the end of a string over your head. It forces fresh water that melts at the poles. The centrifugal force is pushing it down towards the equator, all around the pole. Now remember, this is like distilled water, no mineral content. So it has what is called a lower specific gravity. It doesn't weigh as much. It doesn't weigh as much as the heavily mineral-laden water that's coming up the coast of the United States in the Gulf Stream, which has all those minerals from the nice one. Well, you know how when you want to dissolve a, a, a teaspoon of sugar in your coffee, it always dissolves better when the coffee's nice and hot. If the coffee's cold, it, wasn't, it won't dissolve as fast. Well, the same is true for warm water coming up the coast of the United States. This Gulf Stream current comes up the United States, the East Coast, and then it branches off and it cuts across the North Atlantic. And it's what helps to keep Europe warm in the wintertime. But if, for some reason, that conveyor of warmth is cut off. Europe starts to have really, really bad, really, really cold weathers. In fact, you may, if you've read uh, uh, Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance, he actually describes an event where an ice dam in the Great Lakes region broke right before the Revolutionary War, and this tremendous volume of ice melt from the glaciers came down through the St. Lawrence River Valley and cut out into the ocean and cut off the Gulf Stream current with all this fresh water that had no mineral content. So it was sitting on the surface. And the weather patterns around the world, in many cases, are determined by the temperature, the surface temperature of the water. So in a way, you can almost see that this, this temperature reduction at the surface 
because of all this cold, fresh water from the melt-off of the Arctic, is actually a way of the Earth trying to find a balance. As that cold water comes down, it stays right on the surface. The air that crosses over it, the weather becomes colder. And so you get more, snow, more snowstorms, theoretically you get more snow, more reflectivity, and pretty soon the Earth starts to shift back towards the normal temperatures we're used to. The problem is that because of all the cold, fresh water on the surface, the Gulf Stream current is being subducted, it's being pushed down to the bottom of the North Atlantic and up through the Labrador Strait, which is between the northern part of Canada and where Greenland is. And there are tremendous deposits on the sea floor in that area of methane hydrates. It's like methane that's frozen and combined with water. Now, as these deposits are melting, they're instantly sublimating into gas. And so you have all these bubbles percolating up through the ocean. As you're going out there in the ship, you can see these, these massive plumes of methane coming up off the sea floor. And that stuff, when it gets up in the atmosphere, it's several orders of magnitude more powerful at holding the heat left by the sun in the atmosphere, much more than carbon dioxide. It's much worse than carbon dioxide. And there are plumes of methane coming off the northern part of the Atlantic right now and throughout the Arctic because of this process mm -hmm. that may actually push us beyond the threshold behind that, that cycle back and forth between really cold and really warm winters to the point where we have really warm worldwide all the time. Now, other evidence of this. I have a number of contacts that work with Fish and Game. Most people don't know this, but Fish and Game comes under the purview of the um, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Now, when the different fishing fleets go out into the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Straits looking for cod, looking for giant crabs and this kind of stuff. A lot of times what they do is they take these giant, looks like a giant cage with a one-way opening, like a little, like a cone shaped, and they put some bait in there. And the cod, if they're trying to get cod or, or lobster, they'll go in through this opening and they'll get to the bait, but they can't figure out how to get back out again. So when they pull this up, they've got a, a pot, as they call it. It's full of lobster or full of cod or whatever they happen to be targeting as the, as the fish they're harvesting. Right now, as of this last summer, normally the amount of tonnage that allowed, that's allowed to be harvested out of these areas is set by Fish and Wildlife and NOAA. So many thousands of tons of fish. Usually, in a good year, when things are going normally, that harvest target, that quota, can be met in 90 days. And if your fleet happens to be the one that doesn't pick the right spot and you don't catch anything, you go home empty. You don't get any money. You may go out of business. But they leave the seeds in open up until the point where that total quota has been harvested out of that particular region. It used to be 90 days. Now it's staying open for 10 months. And they're still not getting the quota. And when they pull the pots up, what are they finding? They're not finding cod. They're finding seals and sea lions that swam in to get the bait and couldn't get out again and drowned. That's what they're finding. We call it bycatch. That's the term. So why is this happening? Remember I talked about the fact that the melt-off of the ice has no mineral content, and the lack of mineral content means there's no plankton because there's nothing for them to eat. These single-cell organisms live on the minerals and stuff in the water. So if there's no plankton, because it's being pushed further south by the cold waters that have no mineral content. It means that the fish that rely on the organisms that go up through the different stages of the food chain, they don't have anything to eat either. But pretty soon, you start finding fish that are grossly underweight, or they just die from starvation. You find seabirds washing up on the shore that are skin and bones, because there's nothing for them to eat. All up and down the west coast of the United States, they're finding sea lions. Sea lion pups, seal pups, washing up on the shore, starved to death, just skin and bones, with barely enough fat to keep them warm when they're in the water, because there's nothing for them to eat. So why? Why is it happening? So I, I look at this aspect of the situation, I say, well, maybe, maybe there's a reason to keep spraying. Maybe there's a reason to try and cool things down so the melt-off will stop, 
so that this mineral-free water that's pushing the plankton away or killing the plankton will stop. I can only hope that they're trying to do something that will resolve the issue. First and foremost, my suggestion to each of you would be to do your own research, figure out for yourself in your own minds whether what I'm telling you has any, holds any water at all, no pun intended. But, but the, the point is that once you have decided for yourself whether or not this is something that you really need to get on board with and really address, you need to send letters to your congressmen and your senators. You need to, to pull down these documents from Dane Wigington's website, geoengineering.org, I think it is, um, so that you can use these as a basis, as a platform for launching your argument as to why you think this should be stopped. At, at a minimum, if there's some overriding emergency, whether it's an unseen enemy that's coming over our airspace, and this, of course, this is happening worldwide, so it makes you wonder who, who's, who's looking after who. But if, if in fact, there's an overriding reason for why this is going on, we deserve to know. At the very least, we deserve to know. And, and it's obvious that, from all the government documents, that they, they do know there's, that there's a reason for putting the aerosols in the air. You had your hand up next. Um, well, on the day that the government shut down, if you remember then, yeah. um, they were still spraying. So what I've heard is, this is above our government, that George Soros is one of the people who's funding this. Mm -hmm. So, how do we find out who's really doing this? And then, what are some sites that we can go to to see who's really monitoring it well and in a reputable way? Okay. Here's, here's one approach that I was looking at, sort of to answer your question for myself, because what, you, what you've asked, I, I didn't know about the George Soros part of it, but my question to myself was the same thing. You know, who's funding this, who's overseeing it, who's managing this program. And so I begin looking at all the possible um, oversight issues, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you in a second so you don't have to hold your hand. One of the things that I found was under Title 50, United States Code, which has to do with chemical and biological warfare statutes. And in that particular section, it, it gives you all the reasons why these chemicals that are deemed to be harmful to human life are not to be sprayed into the environment. The section, this is uh, chapter 32. What it basically says is that it, it should never be sprayed in the environment, but if it needs to be sprayed in the environment, it needs a presidential order. It needs a notification going to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, a, a notice in writing going to the governors of each and every one of the states and the senators <coughs> therein. So this means that they know. This means that they have to know because the chain of command from the president on down through all the different secretaries, it's all got to be in writing. So they have to know. 
So the question is, does this really pose a chemical threat to, to human life? Well, so what I did was I went to OSHA, the Organization of the Occupational Safety and Hazards Administration, and I looked up aluminum oxide nanoparticles. And it turns out that there's a material data safety sheet, an MSDS, for aluminum oxide nanoparticles. And it says very clearly, this is a material that is not to be distributed into the environment without the proper government permits. That means that there's got to be writing. There's got to be a, a notification. So, yeah, we're spraying this stuff in the air. Okay. So, the president, secretary of health and human services, the governor of the state, they all have to know. They have to be notified in writing according to these statutes. And if they're not being notified, then there's a major violation going on of these biological and chemical warfare statutes. So, so in answer to your question, Freedom of Information Act requests should be going to these different people. And one of the ways to do it is to look at the skies, get yourself a big old pair of binoculars, and look at those planes, see if you can see a livery. And what I'm finding is that most of the planes that are flying over our area are Boeing 737-800s, are the ones with little fins out on the wingtips. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're flying in the livery of Southwest Airlines, most mm -hmm. of them. Right, really now I've seen 747s with the uh, KLM Dutch Airlines. I've seen Air Australia. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few Airbus uh, aircraft, but most of them are from Boeing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm sorry, this lady here had a question. Yes, what about uh, zero frequency technology? In zero weapons? point energy? Oh. Zero, zero, point point zero point energy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and it, is that related to? Okay. Um, zero point energy is is a, a, a different kind of technology. Um, there are instances where this kind of effect could be achieved using zero point energy. Uh, although I think that um, a little background, zero point energy scalar energy, sometimes called psychotronic energy or longitudinal waves. This energy form is in the environment, it's all around us all the time, and it basically remains undetected because it's in equilibrium. It's distributed through the environment. They've even found that if you could tap into the complete energy density in just a cubic foot of airspace, you could fry the oceans of the entire planet. That's how much energy is embedded in space-time. But you need the proper kind of equipment, very sophisticated equipment to use that, to be able to tap into it. And, and there's a very dangerous possibility that if you did tap into it, that you might not be able to shut the system down. And that you'd wind up with something like a nuclear explosion. It's one of the reasons why that technology is so tightly controlled. So. I understand that it is developed, and being more so developed internationally, internationally but just not in the United States. That's true. That's true. Yeah, Israel's had it for quite a while. Yes. Is it known whether other countries have these capabilities? Um, as, like I was saying, I think it's a pretty good chance that Israel has a capability. China said right before the Olympics, not to worry, we control the weather. Uh, that's a quote. Um, and, and I have a friend who uh, is involved in science, or I'm sorry, time studies. And his company sent him to Beijing a couple months before the Olympics occurred over there. And he said there was so much fog, he couldn't see the buildings across the street. So when the Olympics came and everything was nice and clear, of course, we know that they shut down most of the traffic around that region for a number of weeks before the Olympics came up. But th the fact is that, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a problem. So, I'm sorry, sir. Is that? Yeah. Uh, the Russians offered to, uh, to uh, put out the, the fires of Indonesia when well, if you can control Using where the rain falls, that's one of the ways you could do it. Using a satellite. Mm -hmm. That's possible. How is it dispersed? Is it dispersed by a regular airliner I might fly on, or is it a fleet of separate planes that does this? And aren't, aren't fuel guys talking? Do they say well, that's, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Because the FAA has very strict requirements about the kinds of fuel that go into the planes. And so if they're using these planes that have the, the silica gels and, and metallized uh, particles of aluminum oxide and so forth. That's got to be part of the registry as far as that flight, when it goes up, this kind of thing. I know that it's coming out of the engines. One of the signs that it's part of the fuel, most people don't know this, is that a lot of airliners like uh, 747, uh, a number of aircraft, 
they have what is called an APU, an auxiliary power unit that's in the tail. And it's like a miniature version of a jet engine. It runs on the same fuel as the engines that propel the aircraft. And so when you see chemtrails coming from all the engines, but you also see a little tiny trail in the middle, that shows you that the APU is running on the same fuel and the source of the materials in those aerosols trails is in the fuel. Because otherwise, you wouldn't see a trail coming from the auxiliary power unit also. But, but that's not to say that this is the only way. I've actually seen an Airbus, I think it was an A310. I'm, I'm not sure the model numbers on Airbus airliners, but it was a, it was a, a twin engine jumbo jet flying over Ray. It's about three years ago. And it had aerosol coming from the entire trailing edge of the main wing. The whole wing was releasing this material. It was like a big swath. Now, another thing, I'll get to you in just a second. Another thing I saw, this was January 28th, this year, at 4.20 in the afternoon, near Millville Plains in Southern California, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, in, um, near Reading, it's east of Reading, about 10, 15 miles, was a northbound four-engine aircraft. And this aircraft was leaving a big trail from all four engines, and it got to about 45 degree angle, and it suddenly stopped. And then, there were four little trails. And they were in sequence, one from each engine. It was like purging the lines. A little spurt from engine one, a little spurt from engine four, a little spurt from engine two, a little spurt. And they were, you know, in sequence, one after the other. So it was like these jig jog lines, and then it started spraying again, full force. So it's clear to me that someone was aware that here's a system we're switching from tank number one to tank number two, and we've got to purge the lines before we introduce the new supply into the engine. It was very obvious. This is not something that could have been done because of condensation. So, do you have a question? I do. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, based on your past access with defense, years ago I read something about um, that all NATO nations were involved in this, but non-NATO nations weren't. Do you know what I mean? I've seen that same, that same uh, uh, article. It's a global problem. Yes, but, absolutely. I'm just curious. Um, uh, because of some of the interviews that I've done on the radio that have gone on over the internet, I've, I've gotten emails from people all over the world, from Indonesia, Hawaii, Scandinavia, uh, even from, uh, from Hong Kong, um, one or two from Africa, and they all say the same thing, that it's happening worldwide. Now, I've, I've heard it said that the spraying has not occurred over in China or over North Korea. Now, uh, I've, I've looked at a lot of the worldwide, worldwide satellite photography, and, and I haven't seen any evidence that they are spraying over those areas, so I don't really know. But I, I did see that same article, and, 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 and it makes you wonder. So, um, you had a question? Mm -hmm. So given the nature of our time right now, I'm wondering if you can focus in, one, if there's any really important topic you haven't covered in, in a few minutes, and as far as empowering all of us here, from all the information you've experienced and you know, taken in, what's the best couple of steps that any one of us might do to engage and take action? Okay, first thing I would suggest is that first chance you get, you start going up on Google or one of those big search engines and start plugging in phrases like toxicology, aluminum nanoparticles, barium nanoparticles. Look up the material safety data sheet with OSHA to see for yourself that these things are deemed to be toxic by the government itself. And then you also need to go and find some way to show that these materials are showing up in your local areas. If you can get a soil sample and take it to a laboratory and prove that there are certain quantities of barium strontium and aluminum oxide in your local soils, then you know that you're being a recipient of this material. Now, then you can point out the chemical and biological warfare statutes under Title 50, United States Code, Chapter 32, Section 1215, I believe it is, which says that there is this chain of, of notification that occurs. It comes all the way down from the President's office through the Secretary of Health and Human Services to the governors of each and every state, the senators and congressmen. So they all know. And they're all responsive. They, they, they're legally responsible to answer to the Freedom of Information Act. So, uh, just a second. So, this is one of the things I would encourage you to do: is start sending letters. And and the best thing you can do is is try and put together as many facts as you can find for yourself about the toxicology, the, the that U.S. Air Force paper that was uh, put together at Wright Patterson Air Force Base between '93 and 2001, 
called in vitro toxicity of aluminum nanoparticles in rat alveolar macrophages. Because this this um, city councilman, or I'm sorry, county board supervisors, remember, they came to the presentation that Bain and several others did. Uh, he showed up with that very document from the email that I sent him, and he was so stumped and so completely shocked by what it had to say. And clearly, that this material is affecting your immune system and has an impact even on the mitochondria in your systems. So these are things that you can use as tools to hold up and say, see here, this is something that's serious. This is affecting all of us. Why is this going on and when will it stop? And if not, why not? So it's very simple. I mean, you don't have to get into a big, long-winded tale of all the trails that you've seen and you know, this, that, and the other thing. Just keep it simple, keep it concise, demand an answer through the Freedom of Information Act. And there, there, there is a Freedom of Information Act website that you can go to on the internet that explains how to properly format a question that you send or, or a, 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 an inquiry using that particular format. It tells you what to say, how to say it, how to format, and then where to send it. Is there a, a body of people or a body of attorneys or somebody that we can contact that for them to get in touch with the government and saying, you know, a court thing or whatever it is? Well, there, there so are, there are yes, you're right. There are several attorneys that are preparing what amounts to a class action lawsuit there you go. regarding this particular subject. I'm a signatory on, on that as one of the witnesses, I guess you'd say. Um, the person that you would want to ask for the specific identity and how to contact those attorneys would be Dane Wigington at that website, geoengineeringwatch.org. And you can easily find it on the internet, but he would be the person to ask who the specific individuals are.